sometimes quite deep vertical lines and I always wondered what they were since I've been better those lines are going away so it had something to do with my kidney so that's when everybody looks at their nails <laughs> <laughs> but I ask when I have my nails done how often do you see vertical lines on people they don't see them very often so it is unusual and so I think that that was but that was like the only sign I had that I was sick I didn't have any symptoms of any kind and um, luckily, I had gone on a trip with my sister to Croatia to walk. And after I got back, two weeks later, I had a fever. I had a fever and I had gastrointestinal upset. And the fever went away. The digestive trouble didn't go away, so I went to the doctor. He said, well, you might have a parasite. Maybe you caught know, a parasite on the way. And um, no, that wasn't it. Oh. Well, we'll send you for an ultrasound and a colonoscopy, and we'll find out what's going on. And so eventually they found out I had a bacterial infection, which cleared up, but they took the ultrasound and saw a shadow on my left kidney. Oh, shadow on your kidney. So then I was traveling with my husband because they'd written a book. So these were all Tammy flying back for tests and then meeting him in different cities in the U.S. usually. So it was a very strange time. but. Uh, they gave a, had a biopsy, they said, oh, this is just renal cell carcinoma. Lots of people get this, it grows a millimeter a year. People don't die from this problem. So you can do the surgery whenever you want. Uh, that was November. And so we decided we would finish our tour, which was gonna take us to Australia in February. And then I would have the surgery the beginning of March. So we came back, I had the surgery. I recovered very well. I was walking, you know, from downtown midsection U of T to the waterfront and back by six weeks. I was completely rehabilitated. I went to the doctor with my husband and he seemed out of sorts when we sat down and then told me that I had 11 months to live. He said we were wrong. It, it wasn't a renal cell carcinoma. It's something called a Bellini tumor. And this is something that you usually don't find in people because they die before you find them. Mm -hmm. So I was, if I hadn't had this bacterial infection, mm -hmm. they, would have, they wouldn't have found it because I had no symptoms. So I wasn't complaining. It was, the one thing that happened when I was recovering from the first surgery, I started having some pain here, and that's a sign. Mm -hmm. So that's when they got curious, right? And so then I was scheduled for another surgery, May 8th, and I had that surgery, and I was getting better again, and it was a good surgery. I did a lot of prayer before that surgery. Um, I had been traveling with my husband for a year and met many, many, many people, and all of those people sent prayers to me. So I breathed in all those prayers before my surgery, and I think that that's why it went so well. And I told the surgeons, too, that that's what I'd done the night before. So they had the same intention through the surgery, and they said it went very well that the organ came out without any ad adherence to anything, but they also took all the lymph from that side because it had gone into one lymph gland. And uh, I started getting better after the surgery, and then I started having fluid accumulation in my feet. And I called the hospital and they said, oh, well, you've had a major radical surgery, you're going to have some accumulation of fluids. Okay, but my sister was with me. She's a palliative care nurse. She was, you know, she was concerned but that's not her specialty, so we just stuck with that. And then when I went for my checkup with the doctor, by then I wasn't just swollen in my feet, my legs were all swollen up too. And I was starting to feel heavier mm -hmm. in my abdomen. And I came to his office and he sent me to emergency. He said, um, there's you know, something wrong. So they scan did a scan and they found out I had a leak in the lymph 
the mm -hmm. li they had closed off all the lymph. Looked like I had bobby pins all through. You could see in the scan. Look, can you imagine? It's like a spider web, mm -hmm. the lymph, and they had clipped off with clips every one of them, and of course they missed one. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a very difficult thing to do, and so. Uh, they watched me for a bit, then they sent me home and said, uh, um, the best thing for you is to eat a no-fat diet, because that way the lymph isn't working on fat, and maybe the uh, problem that you have there will close, because it's not working anymore, it's not being irritated anymore, it'll, it'll close up. So I went on a non-fat diet, and I had a nurse, they put a tube in my abdomen to drain the fluid and she'd come every day and drain a liter of fluid off of me every day. When I went to the hospital before I had the uh, tube in, they took off, uh, I think it was seven liters of fluid mm -hmm. or nine liters of fluid, it was a lot of fluid. I looked, I was thin but it looked like I was seven months pregnant because all mm -hmm. the accumulation was there. And they didn't want to disrupt too much, so they just had a nurse come and take mm -hmm. off, you know, a little bit a day. And I kept eating this no fat. I was eating, you know, you can imagine, just vegetables and a little bit of meat. No butter, no oil. Mm -hmm. And the meat was had to be skinned fish or skinned chicken breast, something that had no fat in it. And so I did that for just about a month, I think. And I wasn't getting any better. I still had the terrible accumulation. And I was talking with a specialist in the States at MD Anderson Hospital. It's a cancer hospital in Houston that's very uh, good. And I talked to a doctor there, and he said, you know, the only way that you're going to dry up your lymph is if you drain off all that fluid. And so this was uh, right around the raptors. You know when the raptors won? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was right around that time. By the time the Raptors won. I was out of the hospital again, and I was taking care of myself again, and I drained everything off. And when I drained everything off, my blood pressure tanked. Because then, not only did I, I guess I, I wasn't, all my fluid was going into my abdomen. It wasn't going to my body, right? And so I was getting also kind of not really all that aware, mm -hmm. because I was losing, um, all the uh, electrolytes were getting out of balance because I didn't have the fluid. It was complicated. So I went back to the doctor and he put me in emergency. And this time he said that my potassium was out of balance and that I was likely to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And by then I weighed about 90 pounds. Um, and I was, they couldn't get, they couldn't draw blood because my veins had collapsed because there was no fluid in my body, but I stayed in a step, it's called a step room, it's not ICU, it's one down, where there's a nurse with a couple of people, mm -hmm. and they monitored me all up and gave me fluids, and uh, I continued to drain, and eventually they took me out of there and put me in a private room, which now I know is because you're going to be there for a while, mm -hmm. so never ever want a private room in a hospital. The more people you're with, the faster you're going to get out of there. <laughs> so I think that that's, now I know, no, no private rooms for me, no, 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 I, I'm leaving soon. Anyway, I stayed there for five weeks. They, um, at first they were filling me full of fluids and my albumin in my blood was low, that's the protein in your blood, mm -hmm. so they had to give me transfusions and they were giving me transfusions every day and then they said, you know, um, we're going to give you a diet straight to your heart. So then they put a uh, catheter in here, and uh, three days after they started that, I woke up. So I was just, you know, not really there for all that time, and then I woke up and I thought, oh, I have nutrition to my brain again. I can mm -hmm. think. I'm, I'm here, and I think that's when. I think that's when Queenie showed up with a rosary. I think I was awake by then, and I had a pole with nutrition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I had a pole with nutrition, and another, and a and a bag, for just keeping me comfortable. And uh, Queenie brought me a rosary and one for herself, and a little uh, Madonna 
and and uh, Christ Child with an with an Asian flavor to it. It was mm. which I have at home. And we and she offered to come and pray the rosary with me, and I thought, yes, you know, let's do it. So we went downstairs. Uh, it was probably about ten usually in the morning. I would go down to the fourth floor, and at the fourth floor at the Toronto General, there's a great big atrium. It's four stories high, it's full of plants, and it's bright. So it's a really nice place to go. And uh, so Queenie, uh, she described the stories that go with the rosary, and I listened and started to talk. And I talked a lot about my life and about my family. And uh, it was intense. It was intense, but every day I'd go down there for two hours with Queenie, every day. I was there for five weeks. Every day Queenie came. It was, uh, and she brought, you know, the rosary and we, at first we were only inside and then the weather got warmer because it was summer. So then we would walk, I would walk outside with my bag and my, <laughs> we would walk around the block because I wanted to be, stay strong, right? And uh, I needed to get my strength back again. So she'd walk around the block with me outside. And sometimes we'd sit outside and pray the rosary because they had benches. But uh, I found uh, I found those prayers. Uh, I could get all of my fears and my uh, sorrows and my grief. I could get them all out in that two hour period. And then I'd go back to my room and I'd play cards with my family and spend the evening with them. And they were very good, they were there every day. But uh, it was something interesting as my husband wasn't well. He was there, but he wasn't really well. And he asked me, he said something that he thought was remarkable that I never cried through my whole time there. And he just didn't realize that I had been in the atrium with Queenie, uh, shedding tears every day. But that's all it took for me to be able to withstand the, uh, the fear I had, because they didn't know what to do with me. I was, ble I was leaking out. They were feeding me full of TPN. They said, you know, people have these kind of nutritions for 20 years. Like, you can live like this. And people do live like this. And you can also live with a bag. So you're not going to die. And that's what I'd tell my family. I'm not going to die. And they would look at me like uh, I'd said something that just didn't make any sense at all. Because they'd look at me and then hear me say, I'm not going to die. Like, this isn't so bad. And I couldn't get the same, I couldn't get the same response out of them. I was full of God. I was full of God. And when they came to see me, it was obvious that they were um, grateful that I felt that way, but they didn't necessarily feel that way. Mm -hmm. But I think it was, I mean, I can't imagine it could have been any better for them because I was at peace with what was going on. And I had five weeks of people coming in with suggestions, but not really knowing what to do. And uh, so we went through all the rosary. I would speak one half and Queenie would speak the other half. And at the very end of that, finally they, d they decided I had to go to Pennsylvania. There was a interventional radiologist there. There was one in Canada too, but Canada doesn't always have the funds for the machines that they have in the States. And so they had an MRI guided um, interventional radiology. So they'd fill you full of dye and oil, poppy seed oil, fill my lymph full of that, and then look on the screen and be able to see a plume where, the, where it was leaking out. Mm -hmm. So he was quite certain that he was going to find this, but he told me even if he didn't find it, that he wouldn't stop, that the in interventions would get more and more severe, but they would find what was going on in there. And the worst case scenario was I'd end up with a shunt from my abdomen to my heart. And so again, it was like, okay, I'm here. I may not swim again. But <laughs> other than that, I think, you know, things could be all right. 
So uh, before I left to Pennsylvania, uh, Father Eric um, volunteered to come over and bless me before my trip. And uh, I accepted and was grateful for that. And when he came in, he, he blessed me. And then he gave me uh, the novena for the ill people. It's a nine day prayer. To say how's the for you? Yeah. And uh, he said um, that I could um, meditate on uh, being grateful as well over these next nine days. So we flew down, someone offered us a private jet, flew me down to uh, Philadelphia and put me in a room and the morning of my surgery there was a storm and the surgeon was late because a tree fell on his car. So he had to get his car fixed. In the meantime, I heard all about interventional radiology and where it came from. It came from Russia. That's where it was developed. There was a Rus Russian surgeon who developed it. He was living in France, not knowing that his mother had had a, an affair with a Russian. So that wasn't his father. And when he grew up, he became a surgeon, just like his father, and in his lifetime never knew. But after he died, the story came out that he was the son of this famous surgeon in Russia, and now, and, and then he came to the United States and developed interventional radiology, which they use a lot in the heart because the lymph in the heart often gets damaged, but in the abdomen, it's new. Because there, this ray, this very radical surgery of taking out all your lymph hasn't been around for very long. They would take out your organ, but if it got into your lymph, you know what you used to hear. If someone had cancer and it got into their lymph, oh, well, now it's in their lymph, it's in their whole body. Mm -hmm. But that isn't necessarily the case anymore. If they can catch it early on in the lymph, they can actually extract the lymph. Mm -hmm. And then it, it doesn't have a way of getting around. It can still reoccur, but not in that specific way. So, Father Eric gave me the novena from St. Jose, Jose Maria, and I started praying those prayers every day. Uh, I got down there on a Tuesday, or Tuesday night. Wednesday I had an appointment. Thursday I had the surgery, and it was unsuccessful. He couldn't find the leak. Uh, with all his technology. But he said the poppy seed oil sometimes can irritate because I, when I looked at my abdomen afterwards, there are little pinholes all over. He had looked everywhere. He had done whatever he could to find that leak and he couldn't find it. But he said sometimes people, because of the poppy seed oil, the poppy seed oil will irritate the lymph and because of that it'll make a It'll put down healing uh, tissue, and then you'll and then it'll close. Mm -hmm. So they said, for now, just we'll put you back on a no-fat diet. So I was eating, you know, like egg, uh, egg whites, mm -hmm. things like that, egg whites and vegetables or something like that. And I could sit outside, so that was nice. And my family could come and have breakfast with me, and that was good. And I did that for a number of days. And then, I think it was Saturday, they were saying, okay, Monday we're going to do a new procedure. But before we do it, we want you to try to eat some fat because we have to see if there's been any healing at all. Because if you put a little fat in the diet, then whatever is in the bag isn't clear anymore. It becomes uh, milky colored. Because the lymph, what it does is, it does extract the fat and takes out from the food the waste products and puts it back through the blood. Anyway, so I was with my sister-in-law and she's a nurse too and I said maybe we should just like have some, you know, have a regular dinner, like right now and just see. I mean, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so I ate a regular dinner Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, I, I had eaten my breakfast. It also had fat in it. I think I had whole eggs with yolks and everything. And uh, one of the uh, doctors, uh, two of the doctors, doctor and a nurse came and sat down with me. 
they were looking quite concerned and they said, well, I think that you should try this fat challenge. And I said, well, I tried it last night and this morning. And they said, oh, well, let's see. And so I pulled up the bag and there was no fat in the bag. And they were shocked. They said, oh, um, so you ate fat last night and, and this morning. Yeah, well, if it was still leaking, then you would have fat in there. And there's no fat in there. So you're better. You just, you just healed. You just healed without mm -hmm. the interventions that we were having to do. You healed on your own. And it, it, it was probably something to do with the poppy seed oil. But I prayed, I think I prayed for seven days. It was something mm -hmm. like, there were nine days of prayer. But when I read back through it, I remember all the prayers. But I know that I got better before the end of the prayers. I'm just not sure exactly what day it was. So within half an hour I was back in my room and they took out this and they took out that and let me go home. <laughs> like, just like that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. And I was uh, grateful. I was grateful. And then they said, you know, just eat. What they say? You can walk, but not too far. And you can eat, but not too much fat. <laughs> and then they called me every week for a number of weeks, for about a month. They called me every week, asked me how I was. I was okay. Okay, well, after, I can't remember how long, it was a month or two months or something. They said, okay, you're good. Oh. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so I was done, so I was better. Yeah, so you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. You just have to have faith. <laughs> That's what I think. Tammy, what was it about the rosary that gave you strength and peace? Oh, well, I think it was the intention because really the way that you would say the story that would go along with each, we weren't looking at anything, you know, we were just talking. And you would explain uh, about uh, you know the joyful or the sorrowful and we'd go or the um, or the glorious you know so we would go through uh, say the uh, the story where the angel comes to Mary and and what does that mean we talk about that what does that mean you know well humility okay okay so then I could think about humility and pray. And so I continue to do that. Like I have a, um, on Keep, I put a little app that says all the mm, humility, faith, hope, you know, the, all of the intentions for each story. And so I continue to look at those. And I know some of them now because I've been doing this for a long time. But the stories in the rosary are they're subtle so you don't necessarily know what they mean like what do they mean what does it mean when mary and uh, christ are at the feast in in cana and, and there's no wine what does that mean when she says you know give him some wine and he says i'm not doing anything yet it's not my time <laughs> but yet the, but yet there it is you know so so what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, faith, you know, it means faith. And the sorrowful, because my husband's still not well, I find the sorrowful rosary very helpful, the crucifixion, because he is suffering and his is going to suffer for a longer amount of time. And it's all about suffering suffering with grace, suffering with God's grace, whether you're going to live or not. Um, it's how you can do that and not torture yourself any more than life is torturing you at the time. So I find that I can read different rosaries. Oh, and I really like the end, the whole end, because then you pray to the departed. And I've prayed to my mother for years. She died in 2007. Rest her soul. And 
I had, that was who I prayed to all the time, was I prayed to my mom. But now, in the rosary, right at the very bottom, you pray to the departed and hope you can rest in peace. And that's beautiful because every day then, there's that little bit that I can, that I can meditate on that is my mother, my aunt, my grandparents, you know, everybody that I've, that I've seen and who are now gone. I can think of them every day. And it's built in, it's, it's such a perfectly simple way of humbling yourself, remembering your faith, having hope, uh, charity, and remembrance for those who've passed. And so if I do that every morning, it's a very great way to start the day with the proper intention. So I do it in, I have a sauna at home, I pray the rosary in the sauna, or I go for a walk and pray the rosary, or I sit in the backyard if it's sunny and pray the rosary. Uh, I do a lot of self-reflection, but some days I may, might miss the self-reflection or it, it comes later in the day, but the rosary very rarely comes later in the day because it doesn't take that long and you can, I mean, it doesn't take that long. And the other thing that happened, I have this little rosary. <laughs> I have a cousin, I have two cousins that I grew up with. Uh, their mom was my mom's sister. Um, and uh, my cousin didn't know that I'd been ill. And then she saw something online or something that, and her son told her that I would, I'd been ill. So she phoned me in, so I phoned her back and uh, I told her it was okay that I was feeling good and it was just nice to hear from her. And she said, well, I'm gonna send you something. So the next time I was home, I, you know, I looked through the mail and I found this envelope and inside it was a picture of uh, my grandmother and my grandfather and their mother. And she was Polish, Magdalena Kowalski was her name. And she had a rosary through her life and she gave it to my grandmother when my grandmother died at 98. I think Magdalene died at 104. And then she gave it to my cousin when my grandma died and she gave it to me. So now I have this rosary and it's very fine. So, so I pray this rosary. Do you want to see? Yeah. Yeah. So I pray that rosary every day and it's, she kept it with her every day for all her life. And then my grandma kept it with her, and then my cousin kept it with her, and she gave it to me. That's so a now well I use rosary. It is, isn't it? <laughs> That's so beautiful. You're welcome yeah. to have it around. It's so precious. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's so precious. And uh, Queenie was saying that Poland is a very special place. It is. So, yeah. Yeah. Tammy, before you got sick, you didn't really go to church or anything. You didn't I tried now and then, but it didn't really sit with me. I didn't find a place that I felt was my place. That's true. Hmm. So what is it about getting sick that made you turn to God? Some people rebel when they get sick. Yeah, well, I think that I did. It. Well, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it rebellion, but I, when I first found out I had cancer, I... Uh, I didn't really tell anybody. I mean, I told my husband, and um, his family are very much in our lives. Um, and I may have told my sister, but I was just going to have the surgery, and then that was going to be that, because they took a, part, a piece of my kidney out. That was all right. But then when I went to my post-op, and they told me I was going to die in 11 months, I thought, oh, this isn't what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. This is something much, much different. And so then I... I did tell everyone, but the, f oh no, that wasn't my first response. My first response is, I'm going to die. I've lived 58 years. That's not bad. But then I looked at my family and they were crushed, right? And I thought, oh my goodness, uh, oh my goodness, they're suffering. And I didn't think, I must be suffering. I didn't even think that. From mm, my mother... My mother's father, when he was a little guy, was brought to Canada 
from Scotland. And uh, her husband was uh, killed in a fire at a rooming house in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And so when she arrived, there was no money and no husband. And so she had to go out and work in a logging camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandpa was a kid then, and he was abused in the logging camp. And so he grew up, uh, married my grandmother, and when the kids were not so old, I heard a story of they were riding a horse, and the horse knocked one of the kids off, and they watched their father nearly beat the horse to death. So he was, he had rage that he couldn't control. Mm -hmm. He was damaged, a damaged person, and my mom was damaged from that, and so was her sisters. And so when I grew up, I inherited some of that. So it wasn't obvious to me when I was told I was going to die that that was something that I should have mercy for myself in any way. I just thought, okay, I'm going to die. But then I looked at my family, and I have such a good family. They, were, they showed me what I should be feeling. They showed me the, of the pain that I was in. And so then I thought, well, I'll try everything I can to get better. That's why people, that's why people go through chemotherapy and radiation and all this stuff. It's because they want to survive for the people they love. Mm -hmm. And I did love my people, right? And then the rosary, it taught me to love myself. It taught me to have uh, mercy for myself and that my suffering was something that I could go through because, well, because God was with me. And I never, I, I never had that feeling before I started reciting the, the rosary that God was with me. So when I was first told I was going to die, I was just going to die. That was that. Because it was me, but it isn't just me. You know, it's me and God. It's my family and God. And uh, if that doesn't have to be the plan, well then, Let's see what else that there is out there and to try, and to try to um, take the challenge that God has given me. He gave me a challenge, right? And, but at first I wasn't even going to take that challenge. I didn't see what was, so in, what was important about me that I should take that challenge. But once I realized that it was a challenge from God, well then, and that he has his plan for me, and that if this was a, if he was knocking on my door that hard, then I better wake up. <laughs> so I woke up. Definitely woke up. Now, Tam, suffering is obviously something that isn't good, and illness as well. But what would you say would be something good that has happened as a result of your illness and your suffering? Well, um, I, have, I have a different, I have a much different uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. I have a much different point of view of, of, the, of myself, of myself. I have more compassion for myself which gives me more compassion for other people. You know, I have less resentment towards others, which comes from me being kinder to myself. When people are unkind to themselves, they end up doing things that they can't do or shouldn't have done, and then they end up being resentful to those people that they've done it for, even though they've told themselves to go and do it, because they're not kind to themselves. You have to be kind, you have to have the same compassion and tolerance and kindness to yourself as you do to, to other people. And when you're praying, you're praying with God. He's, he's telling you, this is, this is who you'll be. You, you are to be like a child and come to me. Which, and children, you know, they, they aren't mean to themselves. They're kind to themselves. They, they have tolerance for themselves. They love themselves. They know they're important to their to their mothers, you know, they smile, an incredible smile when their moms look at them because all they want is to be there with them and to belong and to learn 
And if we come to Jesus as children, then we're coming to Jesus as people who are kind and loving and tolerant. And the whole idea is service. But you can't, you can't go and give proper service if you're not serving yourself the way that you have to. Otherwise, it comes out wrong. And it's damaging. And that's not service. Right? So I know I have a, a neighbor who's very angry person. And I feel for her because I know she's as hard as she is on me, she's harder on herself. Mm -hmm. And that's so sad. Right? So when I see, just when I see suffering, I know when you see these guys on the street, you know, and they're yelling, and they're tormented, just think what they're like inside. It's it's so mm -hmm. sad and they are without our savior, you know, they're not aware, full of ego, yeah, God's here, we're here, mm -hmm. right, always, as soon as we think we're here, we got it wrong, <laughs> <laughs> we got it wrong, things just don't go well when you're up high. I think after you got better, uh, you mentioned that because of that, because of your cure, you're going to do something. I'm going to always share. So yesterday, yesterday, I spoke to about a dozen women in Iran about what, my life. On Zoom. On Zoom. <laughs> you, you can do all that now because of Zoom, right? Uh, and someone, I was in a meeting and someone asked if, if I would share. I said, yes. I said, I prayed. God, when I was sick, I said, if you let me live, I'm going to share. Whatever you want me to share, I'll share. And I never used to share at all. No. In fact, tomorrow I go for a scan of my abdomen. And so yesterday, I was feeling a little like hiding, mm -hmm. right? So I was visiting my husband. I wouldn't sit with him. I'd sit by him, but I wouldn't sit with him. And I'm like, I didn't know what was going on, and then, uh, and then I thought, you know, I need uh, some people to take the, my place for a while. I'm doing too much, right? I'm doing too much, so I have to make sure I get help. So I reached out to my son, who's making a schedule of people to visit my husband, and but then this morning I realized, oh, I'm going for a scan. I'm afraid, and when I'm afraid, I re I retreat, mm -hmm. and. That's, it, uh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I caught it. I'm retreating. I shouldn't be retreating. Uh, or if I am retreating, retreat to someone, not retreat from someone. Retreat to someone. So now I feel better. Even though I'm still nervous, I'm not feeling like I have to retreat. And, and another habit that I had in my life that didn't serve me well, I would, if I had to cry or... or I would go into a room by myself and cry. Yeah. Now I get a hug and cry. You know, and that's the right way to do it. So I've learned just to, well, be kinder to myself, really. And I'm still learning that every day. And that's why I have to pray every day. Because these things, they come back. You know, my old behaviors, they come back. If I don't uh, reaffirm them every day. If so, if you want to change, if you want to become new, with a new intention, you have to stay present with that. Every day, I have to have God with me all the time. Because if I don't have Him there all the time, then I become willful, you know, arrogant, uh, dishonest. And they're subtle, these things, they're subtle. It could be in my thinking is dishonest, right? It can be my thinking. And you might not think of your thinking as anything. You know, I can think whatever I want. Nobody knows. But yeah, God knows. <laughs> and so you know. And so it flavors who you are if you're thinking the wrong way. I mean, you see these people walking down the street, they're thinking the way they shouldn't be thinking, and it's torture. Mm -hmm. So you can torture yourself and nobody will know. But that doesn't make it okay. That That's definitely not 
How do you think we could, like I think most of us here, they, we do believe in God and we love him and we know he loves us, but how can we share that with other people? I, I mean, I haven't had the experience, so I don't think I, in, well, I guess I could share, but like I don't know how I could share it. Like how would you suggest that we share that love that we realize that God has for us? I think we can only talk about our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the only way to share. The only real way to share is from our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, when you go into the churches, yeah, people go to the mass. Many people are, you know, older. Yes. And there are few young people. Yeah. So young people don't seem to be taking church or God or prayer very seriously. What would you say to them? You can make the telephone your highest power, and I think a lot of us have done that. That that we you know we carry it everywhere. We make sure it's charged. We answer it whenever it calls. You know, so we have to be very careful. Technology, I think, has the it has the capacity to take the place of God. And that would be a tragedy for humankind. But it can it be something as simple as a TV that you, or, or your friend, or your husband, that you decided is your higher power, and then you become codependent, right? That you'll do anything for them and sacrifice yourself to them, but that's not, that's not a good way to live either. So you have to be careful, you have to think about what in your life, shopping, what do you turn to? Food? Like what is it? What is it that is your uh, place of peace? Is it chocolate? You know, and and yeah, you know, it's going to be now and then. But we have to be aware that those that we uh, turn we turn there and we don't turn to God. Why? Why would you turn to food instead of to God? Why would you turn to shopping instead of God. Why would you turn to being busy? That's what I do. So if I get nervous, I get busy. I get a lot done. But the other day, I got busy. And what was I? Oh, my husband had just come back from the hospital. So I was nervous about him coming back. And I ended up scheduling a good thing. And I don't care. I was taking care of myself. But I had scheduled over another appointment that I had with someone, and she was very understanding. But if it had been someone else, that it, it, who knows who it might have been and what it might have been, because I was being busy instead of being with God, I got mixed up in my priorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you'll have to meditate every day and find out what you're doing, what you're turning to in your time of need. And your time of need can just be that you have to write an essay, you know? What do you turn to instead of writing the essay? And we all do those things. You tidy our room. Tidy our room. It's good to have a tidy room, but if you're <laughs> but if you're not doing your essay because your room is not tidy enough, then that's not that's not the right priority. You got sick. How did your priorities change? Um, my priorities changed. Well, <clears throat> you want to know all my bad habits? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no just, um, how you managed to put the more, how you were able to identify what was most important in life. Knowing that you were going to die or thinking that you were going to die, what made you realize that certain things were more important? Well, as I said, when I decided that it was okay, I was going to die, and then looked at my family and realized it wasn't okay. That was a very, that was a transformational moment in me. I've been sick plenty of times and not told anybody. I've you know, gone through surgeries and stuff and not told anybody, but this time was different, and I brought everybody Anyone who wanted to come, I said yes to. I just, I don't know, it was God's help. With God's help, I realized 
that I didn't have the right point of view, that priorities, that my priorities had to be realigned with God at the top. It's taken me months of reading and self-reflection to realize that. And, you know, in, in different situations, I still look at it the old way and I have to pay attention and realize, oh yeah, so here's another way that I could re-evaluate how I'm doing things, how I'm going forward. You know, and I have to make sure I don't give too much and get resentful, right? So I have to have myself in, uh, in mind with my giving, not give too much, but give enough that I'm doing service without needing anything in return. Uh, but it's all, I, I've done a lot of reading. I've read about codependence and I've read about, I've read about um, all kinds of relationship troubles that, that people have to see if I have problems in any of those ways and, and I have. I have, you know, my sister, my, my daughter was very ill when she was young and uh, I wanted to go to art school. I was in art school when I first moved to Toronto and we were living in faculty housing and you can only live in faculty housing for two years at least, two minutes if you out. And so we had to find a house. So we found a house, but the house, and the house was near my husband's work, so that was good, but it was in terrible shape and we were gonna to have to renovate it. And he said, I'm too busy to renovate the house. You're gonna to have to do it. And I said, okay. Why did I say okay? I was going to art school. You know, wasn't that important to me? It was, it was my life's dream to finish my degree in art school. And I said, okay, and I stopped doing it. And then my daughter was ill. And so I just stayed home. She went to school. She didn't really know. She was this little kid. She didn't really know she was sick, you know. She had rheumatoid arthritis. She had pain, but she thought everybody had pain. You know, little kids, they don't know. She asked me at one point, Mommy, is this little piggy supposed to hurt? Mm, you know? Is it, uh, so it was good I was there, but I gave up myself to be of service, and that's not how you do it. No, otherwise you become resentful. Right, so you have to, I, I could have said, no, I can't, I can't renovate the house. You can't renovate the house. This isn't the house for us, because neither of us can do the work. That would have been an answer if I would have had more insight into what my responsibilities are to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. one final question um, so when people realize what their priorities are yeah. realize that their higher power isn't chocolate right uh, how can they be reminded or how could they remember that okay yeah my higher power is God not chocolate so I'm gonna live like that and just basically keep up with that resolution well Anything? pause pause is very good whenever anybody when, when you're with people and you're asked of something, or you feel uncomfortable, don't don't respond. Just pause, and pause pause for as long as you have to pause. Maybe you have to pause for three weeks before you figure out. So, for instance, I was uh, my my son and his wife have a new baby. He's four months old, oh. cutest little guy, <laughs> and she's from Nova Scotia. And there's a quarantine in Nova Scotia, two week quarantine. And they really, she really wanted to go and show her family, her baby. So I would say every now and then, Where, when are you going to Halifax? And uh, well, she hadn't decided that, she hadn't decided that. So about a month ago or so, I asked her again, so have you decided when you're going to go? And she said, I don't think I'm ever going to get to go. And I said, do you want me to come with you? And she, and she started to cry. And I said, I'll come with you. I said, I'll come with you, we'll quarantine. I said, I'll, uh, I'll buy the little place we have to stay in for two weeks and I'll come with you guys and quarantine with you. 
well, right away they started looking up Airbnbs and getting it all organized. It's amazing. I was like, wow, they, that's all it took. That's all it took. But, so I was really excited that I'd done something right, right? I was really excited that I'd done something right. So I, I uh, texted my daughter, or I phoned her, I can't remember if I phoned her or texted her, probably texted her, and I said, guess what? We're, we're uh, going to Nova Scotia to, to um, uh, introduce Elliot to Jill's family, and I'm going to go and I'm going to buy the Airbnb. And she writes back and says, well, they have lots of money, why couldn't they just buy the Airbnb? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's a weird thing to say. And I, said, I sat with that for three weeks. I sat with that the whole time we were in Nova Scotia. Or I guess I sat with that the week before we went and the whole time we were there thinking, why did she respond like that? Why did she respond like that? And then I realized, oh, I hadn't actually told her exactly what happened that day. What exactly happened that day? I said, are you going to Halifax? She said, no. I said, I'll come with you. She cried. Then I said, I would, it wasn't that, it, it wasn't that I said, I'll buy you the Airbnb and she cried. No, no, no. That was wrong. So I had under communicated to my daughter. I hadn't said the whole story. I had under communicated. And so then there was a misunderstanding. But I sat with it and I paused for three weeks. And then I wrote back, this is what was said that day. And she goes, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and, it, and responded exactly in an appropriate manner. So I realize now that often when there's a misunderstanding, I pause now. I pause now and think, like, now what did I do? What did I do? How did, how did this come about? What did I bring to it? And I know that my husband and I, we learned during our marriage that if we had a disagreement, then we would separate and think, okay, what did we bring to this? And if you could think of anything during your life that might have had to do with why this argument began, that's what you came back with. But now I just do that, not with, not just with a misunderstanding, but with a, a even just a feeling that something isn't quite right. Oh, oh, that's that's an. I wasn't with God there. What did I, what did I do, that was ego driven? Right. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. One last question. Sure. <laughs> On. Fear of missing out, fear of better options. Because a lot of people are afraid to commit because they're afraid that something better is going to come up. So if they commit right now to a relationship or to a certain program, they're afraid that, okay, later on I'm going to be offered something better. So yeah. they don't commit. Right. Any so they have, well, they have a Peter Pan complex, right? They want to stay. They're all potential and no actuality. And that works out really well until you're about 40. That was deep. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and then you're 40, and you're no longer 20, and, you're, and you, don't, you no longer have those opportunities. Or you might have opportunities still, but the people that you're um, competing with are 20 years younger than you because you haven't committed yet. So the younger you... So when I was dying, I thought I was dying, I said, my, my son was visiting me in the hospital, and I thought, what, what, should I, what should I say to him before I die? There's got to be something I want to share. And so then I called him over and I said, you know, you know, uh, your wife really wants to have a baby. He said, yeah, I know. I said, yeah, but think about that. She really wants to have a baby. So what's stopping you from having that happen? When's it going to happen? If she, if that's what she wants, why keep her unhappy until until that time? And so um, now we have this little boy, and he was born in May. Right, right in the right in the when everybody was all in their bubbles, mm -hmm. and I was in the bubble with him. I got to be there with this little guy ever since he was born. Uh, my uh, my son's wife said that when we were in Philadelphia and I was, you know, not knowing if, I, if my intervention was going to work or not, that's when he was conceived. Mm -hmm. And then he was born during this COVID. Like what a perfect baby. And even the month 
I don't know if you know, but the month of May is dedicated to Mary. Oh, there you go. Huh? So, yeah. 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 It's, it's all very special. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought, you know, years and years I've tried, I prayed to my mother. And years and years I was, I didn't know anything about the church, really. And I used to always think, you know, Mary's very underrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think that, not knowing uh, really what was going on at all. But that, so, so I was searching for Mary for a long time. Sure. Oh, you're welcome. I'm you. so grateful to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.